Logarithms NetMon Premium delivers real-time network visibility to quickly identify emerging threats in your IT environment. NetMon Premium is a free, commercial-grade network forensics and traffic analytics solution. You can use NetMon Premium's powerful capabilities to search against all observed network traffic, identify abnormal traffic patterns and application usage, and quickly analyze full packet captures. Take the first step towards real-time network visibility. Visit logarithm.com forward slash freemium to learn more and download it today. Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. For more information, visit them on the web at tenable.com. ProXPN is the leading VPN service, offering free accounts, excellent premium features, and an outstanding commitment to privacy and security online. Use the discount code WEEKLY and save 50% off for life. NetSparker, the developers of desktop and cloud-based web application security scanners that enable you to automatically identify vulnerabilities in your web applications and web services. NetSparker scanners employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities with a proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at netsparker.com or email them at contact at netsparker.com. Welcome back everyone to Paul Security Weekly. This is our security news for this week, and I, I just I want to start off with a, a little bit of a soapbox, um, give everyone a little background about my, my views on, on regulation. Uh, a lot of people that, that may not know, we have a whole podcast network in cigars, and I know some of the feedback, like some people I talk to, like, yeah, I love cigars, and other people are like, yeah, it has absolutely no crossover from security into cigars. In, in all reality, it's like 1% to 5% of the entire population in the United States uh, are, represent cigar smokers. Uh, in any case, in terms of regulation, in, in my estimation, it really is a double-edged sword. I think there are instances where regulation can certainly stifle innovation and really restrict and destroy markets, the open markets. There are other instances where regulation has enabled markets. Uh, and you know, we've heard people that have come on the show and talked about how regulation can be a positive thing for certain markets and uh, enable things to continue. When we talk about the Internet of Things, there's a lot of talk about regulation. And Bruce and I are, and in all of the things that I've read about embedded systems, security, insecurity, Internet of Things, security and insecurity, over the years, Bruce and I has probably posted uh, two or three articles that very concisely in, in the most intelligent way is to describe the problem and recommend solutions out of all of the things that I've read, which is a lot on this topic because it's very near and dear to my heart, to Larry's heart, as we got started on this journey because we were interested in Linksys WT54G routers. We started writing a book about it and then being security researchers, we started looking into the security of it all and were horrified for, for many years. Um, so the observations that Bruce brings up, he says, an additional market failure illustrated by the Dyne attack is that neither the seller nor the buyer of those devices cares about fixing the vulnerability. The owners of those devices don't care. They wanted a webcam or a thermostat or a refrigerator with nice features at a good price. Even after they were recruited into this botnet, they still work fine. You, can, you can't even tell that they were using this attack. The seller of those devices don't care. They've already moved on to selling newer and better models. There is no market solution because the insecurity primarily affects other people. And that brings up, for me, made it very, very clear and concise. It talks about all the things we've talked about on the show before, but in a very clear and concise manner, speaks to how we're crippled in solving the problem other than pretty much someone else like the government coming in and regulating it. He also goes on to say that um, the, uh, our choice isn't between government involvement and no government involvement. Our choice is between smarter government involvement or stupider government involvement. Basically, if we wait to the 9-11 scenario for uh, Internet of Things, we're likely going to get stupid government involvement that's going to make rash decisions that have 
unintended consequences or maybe intended consequences in some cases, but have negative effects on us as individuals and on the market as a whole. Whereas if we get ahead of the problem, we have an opportunity today to implement smarter government regulation. In, in this case, when you put it in the, the point of that the, the consumer doesn't care and the seller doesn't care, the only logical choice is that we need some kind of regulation. And if we do it now, we have an opportunity, a chance, that we could end up with regulation that really truly does make the world a better place. Or maybe I'm just living in utopia. I want to throw it back to... I thought you lived in Rhode Island. I do live in Rhode Island, <laughs> yes. Very similar to utopia, Jeff. Doug can attest, and Larry can attest to that. <laughs> so I, I think it's I think it's ironic that uh, a a community or tribe that, uh, with exceptions, I think mostly is against government regulation or intervention, mm -hmm. uh, has to finally have a discussion about. Uh, if there's going to be any change, if there's any motivation to change, we have to rely on government intervention. And how ironic that we're having this discussion this particular week. Go. <laughs> well, I, I mean, political climate aside, whatever the political climate is, we have to, I think, in this case, work towards smarter government regulation, right? With whatever political factors are at play, <clears throat> We have to, as an industry, as a security community, work towards smart regulation in this case, or at least advising individuals and groups that are going to be the decision makers in this case, that we have regulation uh, that actually uh, makes sense. Great. And I, I, think the, the, I think the political climate is, is <clears throat> irrelevant, given that the internet and IoT stuff is is not U.S. centric. The the internet is for porn. I mean, all over the world. So I, well, I really Larry think regulation up, needs to be larger than just here. It's a great point because if you think about where the majority of these IoT devices are manufactured and then imported into the U.S., it's from all over the world, primarily China, but it's from all over the world. And this, you're right, Larry, is not a U.S. centric problem although the United States is the most connected country in the world, so largely we're, we as the United States are the largest source of the problem because we have so many devices that are connected at the highest bandwidth rates to the Internet. I think the U, good old USA is the largely responsible, has the, the moral responsibility to set the standard to correct this problem because yep. we have the greatest risk of impacting the internet as a whole for the entire but world. But that in and of itself is a political statement, just, just to push back on what Larry said, to, to imply that the U.S. government or the U.S. as a country has a moral obligation for the larger good is in and of itself a political statement. How is that a political statement? Well, is that a political I, statement I, I, I or just talking, a statement? I was talking to some people today, and I think the good news is about this is that we are moving towards a possibility of smarter government because I was talking about the Cybersecurity Congress uh, or the Cybersecurity Caucus in the Congress, which is which is has has sort of you know exceeded the political boundaries because it's co-chaired by a Republican and Democrat. And as we've seen people start to grow up in this world, so like like me or and I, and I know Jack Daniels is not here tonight for us to pick on, but uh, so you get to pick on me instead. But as a lot of us have gotten to that level, we're seeing a little more interest from, from the government in this. And, and that leads to smarter regulation because we've gone from, I don't know what this is. So when somebody comes in and talks about denial of service, they're going, what on earth could that possibly be? To, well, maybe that's of interest to, this is an issue to, how do we fix it? And, and they're starting to ask those questions of people like us instead of just writing bizarre regulations that don't make any sense or bizarre regulations that are 20 years out of date yeah, trying to secure I want to represent the people like us in, in, in this kind of next <clears throat> statement, right? And I think that regulation can have an impact on markets. And I think a lot of us today maybe think, well, all of these big companies that are producing these devices can afford 
the regulation because let's let's face oh. facts. Regulation oh. regulation oh. costs money. Someone has to pay for some kind of validation to make sure that the Internet of Things devices, when they reach the market, are secure. Someone has to pay for that. Now, so. in this case, you may think, well. All these big companies like Cisco and Belkin and Netgear and, and all these devi- all these companies and the export into China and they're making de- they can afford to pay these fees. But what about the people that we've had on this show? Several people we've had on the show. Several people that, who are my friends that are in the security community that have created businesses that are small businesses that are creating these devices and bringing them to market. What if there is a fee that is market limiting to bring your technology to market? So you can't get approval. Because you need ten, twenty, a hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars to get go through the approval process to bring your product to market. That's one of yeah, the so, things that regulation could yep. bring. Paul, I had a. This was a great one because at uh, at Hackfest we uh, I did the talk again from DerbyCon um, about the uh, the IOTA uh, framework for yeah. uh, pen test methodology for IoT devices. And uh, Josh Wright was there, and he asked this fantastic question at the end of the presentation. It was well, how do you deal with, or how do the companies that are very small mm-hmm. that don't have the funds or the profit margin is so narrow that they don't have the funds to do a $50,000 pen test against yes. one of their devices? Exactly my point. And my, my mm-hmm. answer was, if you think about a $50,000 pen test for an embedded device, that's going to be a pretty darn robust pen test, I would argue. What if... That cost got passed on to the consumer. Depending on the number of devices that you are intending to sell, would you be willing to pay, depending on the device, 2 to $5 more for a device you know that had been tested appropriately and is likely missing a lot of the low-hanging fruit crap that we're seeing now? Yeah, but that's, that's not how regulation works. Well, the answer works. from a consumer is- perspective is no. I want to buy the cheapest, the cheapest device. But regulation doesn't work if it only applies to certain groups. Regulation only works to make the Internet a safer place if every dev- new device coming on the market has met specifications. Because if it costs money, everyone's going to say, well, I'm not going to pay the extra money to get the certification because I don't see the marketing benefits. So I'm just going to put my device out there and people are going to buy it. We're going to be in the same situation that we're in right. now. Well, so, so, that re- so that regulation includes a pen test, which you pass the cost of that pen test onto the consumer for 2 to $5 per device. Again, d- it will depend on the device. Well, well you know, to me, the day is passed on they, regardless because right, that's... Right, yes. right. I mean, if, if you think about that investment, and, uh, you know, I'm just uh, I'm you know, throwing this out for discussion. If you yeah. think about that investment, Paul, would you have paid $5 more for your Nest? Well, so, but Google owns Nest, and the companies that are going to be able to absorb those costs and raise prices and still bring a product to market are going to be the larger companies. Where What it comes down to is it still costs that company money in margin. So when sure. we look at a smaller industry like the cigar industry, FDA is, is trying to put in largely going to put regulations on uh, premium handmade cigars in the United States. And what that means is the larger companies will be able to absorb those costs, will be able to pass those prices on to the consumer and still have a wide enough distribution where, yeah, prices might go up, but they're still going to have a product on the market. However, the smaller guys, and to go back to Josh's question, that their margins are so slim that it's going to increase their buy-in by $10,000, 20000 30000 dollars $50,000, they're going to be out of the market. And what that leaves is the big corporations in the market, and that's some of the things but that, that regulation. That like more this. than anything is the, is the purpose of government regulation is to create a, 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 an opportunity for fair trade. Yep, and I right? and I and I think it will. Uh, and you know, I just throwing that out for the discussion. I think it's also going to depend on the cost of the said device. I mean, uh, a four dollar device that's an mm-hmm. IoT device that I'm going to buy from China. Sure, I probably won't pay two or four dollars more. I'd venture to guess that the two or four dollar device from China is not going to have near the feature set that's going to require a fifty thousand dollar pen test. The 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 tricky thing about all this is that regulation leads to barriers to entry, which yes. leads to monopoly. So that's a, yes. that's a, the problem we're talking about Thank here. You, and then all of a sudden, Cisco owns the market because I can't possibly meet those standards. So the way that traditionally you got around that was by moving that 
the, the onus of that to government agencies. So to use an example, the, the FDA. So because farmers can't afford to test and certify and all these things, they shift all this stuff off to other agencies to test to determine if this is reasonable. The problem here is that technology moves so fast that these long-term testing projects with, if you turned it over to NIST or somebody and all of a sudden the product takes nine years to get to market because it takes that long to get it certified, you've got another barrier to even you know growth in technology because it's suddenly nobody can use these and they're all gonna get sold outside the United States and, so and Doug it's a tricky up a, problem. Doug brings up a well, fantastic point that mm-hmm. regulation and certification happens for the product as it stands today. So if I release a device with a certain firmware, every time I update that firmware, in order for this to work, I have to go get recertified. Now, in other markets, like uh, Doug talked about the FDA and, and farmers uh, and uh, agricultural products in the larger sense are... Uh, somewhat protected in that sense and save cost on this regulation because they can say, well, this, this is the uh, like equivalent product. So I'm, I'm using the same plant. I'm maybe just changing the ratio of how much is used or I'm using the same process. I've just changed, you know, when I planted it or, you know, where I got the seeds from or something. So they can, they don't have to pay that recertification fee. With software, as Doug was alluding mm-hmm. to, every time I change any code in my firmware and release a new version, that's got to go get recertified, and i got to go pay for that again, or someone's got to pay for that, that firmware to get recertified. Well, yeah. not to mention that so many applications and products are built on uh, component parts that, uh, right. you know, stop me if you've heard this before, that uh, tend to have vulnerabilities discovered that require patching, but the patching can't occur because it breaks the application. And you know, not to mention, how, to, how when we're talking about what's largely a consumer product, when when does patching come into play? Mm-hmm. And is it even feasible? Yep. So, Paul, while you were while you were saying this thing, I'm thinking, well, this regulation and having to pay the fee for the regulation, I was thinking about a great example, and then you kind of blew that down. But I wanted to bring it up so that maybe there'd be some more discussion around it and some thoughts, because obviously, you know, you know, we're thinking about answers and, and stuff. Um, but one of the device when, you know, you put a device to market that has a transmitter and you tend to market it here in the U.S., it has to go to the FCC. And there's a, uh, I want to say it's a and I, I just had this conversation, and the number is escaping me. It's a thirty to sixty thousand dollar cost to go to the FCC to have this device tested, so that you can sell it here in the U.S. If it has an RF transmitter, what if this process included some testing initially for an initial set of software, and of course now maybe some smaller recertification process based on the initial? And I'm just throwing ideas out there. Yeah, my, my concern with this whole thing, Larry, actually uh, speaks to some of your uh, previous products, uh, projects rather, in that you know you did the badges for CCDC, and yep. what if included with that project was well, yeah, I can do the badges, but we have to pay thirty thousand dollars or some amount of money to the FCC or whoever is going to regulate this process, that would significantly hinder innovation and the technology coming out to the community. That's yep. really that's Absolutely. really my concern. Absolutely, and and, and the, you know the badge thing is I, I totally get the badge thing. Now there's a, obviously a difference between um, uh, products that are intended for uh, you know sale versus a hobbyist project when it comes to that particular regulation. But yeah, I absolutely. But regulations a slippery slope, and this is my other soapbox. <laughs> yeah. Because inside yeah. of the FDA regulations for cigars, <laughs> they've said there's no such thing as samples anymore. You can't give samples out, right? It, what if they do the same thing with technology? They said, well, you can't give, because if you gave stuff away for free to people, they would put it on their home networks, and people are going to use it for a, a DDoS attack or something like that. Mm-hmm, so it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a very, it's a double-edged sword, a slippery slope. I hope that we figure it out. I really, I really hope that there's an answer well, where I, we can make think, products come on the market securely. I, I think at some point it's coming, because there's always the, to quote, you know, the Star Trek thing about the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Right. And as technology, especially Internet of Things technology, becomes ingrained in our society, there's it's just and it's very much like the FCC. You know, there was a time when anyone could have set up a radio transmitter at their house and started broadcasting. 
there's a time when anyone could have set up this and set up that. The problem is that, you know, it's just total chaos. And if IoT becomes this marketplace where every house on your block is generating denial of service attacks against every other house automatically, and all it takes is one neighbor to throw another thermostat on and all of a sudden the whole, you know, subnet goes down, they're going to step in and you are going to get those, you know, 9-11 type Right. Uh, implementation. So kind of, it seems to me like we need to get out in front of it and get smart regulation. I don't know what the answer is. I wish I did. I'd write it up and send it to the, the Congressional Cyber Security it, Caucus. But along the know. lines of what you're saying, Doug, uh, is happening, uh, or researchers have uh, basically disclosed that this is happening today with light bulbs, that scenario you just described. Uh, and I quote from the yeah. article the malicious firmware can disable additional downloads and thus affect. Caused by the worm, blackout, constant flickering, um, and it'll be permanent. What's more, the attack is a worm. It can jump from connected device to connected device through the air. It could potentially knock out an entire city with just one infected light bulb. Basically, light bulbs infect each other and get infected firmware, which then can't be updated, and it's just a trickling effect. And all of a sudden, anyone that has a smart light bulb, I have several in my house, not the model that uh, no, it is a Philips Hue. I'm Philips sorry. Hue. So I yeah, do have Philips the Philips Hue, Hue in my in my home. Uh, can in infect each other and essentially create a worm. I don't know. I but you know. And then you think about well, okay. So my Philips Hue light bulbs go out. What do I? Okay, I unscrew it and put a new well, light yeah. bulb in. But I don't know. There's a lot of places we could go there, Larry. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Paul, I spent a lot of time looking at this because I was teaching the wireless class yesterday, and this actually came up, and mm -hmm. it's been very interesting. So there's Zigbee-enabled light bulbs. Yep. And uh, the Zigbee Alliance actually had their own response to this, which it is not a Zigbee implementation issue. It is actually an implementation issue from software from In the Philips. firmware. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Sorry, um, not, not my table. Yeah, exactly. Not my table. Um, but very, very interesting on the attack in that they had the ability to potentially do all these, you know, these earth shattering things, which I think some of the attack scenarios were a little bit of a stretch. And I'll explain why. But I thought it was really interesting that they had the ability to modify the firmware to mm -hmm. make it permanently do whatever action they wanted and brick the device so that it could not be updated. The only way you could update it was send it back to the factory. Now what happens when they turn that device on in the factory? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, you start pre-infecting those things before they even leave, maybe even after they've left QA Well, process no, because the, like well, the light bulb has to be screwed in and powered before it right. can get the new right. firmware. Well, well, so yeah, then they start bricking all the ones in the QA process while they're on. And, right. Yeah. So from that, those attack scenarios, I thought some of those were a little bit of a stretch in that um, Zigbee is not terribly long distance. Sure, it can build mesh networks, but unless you're, you know, like in our scenario, Paul, where we're, we've got a little bit further distance between houses, um, y your neighbor's got to have a Philips Hue, and then your neighbor neighbor's got to have a Philips Hue, and so forth and so on to be able to build that mesh. Certainly, yeah, because they, um, they flew a yeah. drone, Larry, to infect. They did. But they did, yep. They said from the drone, uh, the team was uh, 70 meters or 229.7 feet away, to yep. cause the lights and go on off automatically. But I'm assuming the yep. Zigbee transmitter they had in the drone could reach those distances. Your bulb Zig does not Zigbee. reach those distances. Um, so does Zigbee, uh, Zigbee on average is about 300 feet. Interesting. Um, okay. And the other one, too, is if the, the other one with the Philips Hue stuff is that as part of this attack, um, they have proximity sensing, so you can only be so far away to program it. Mm -hmm. and oh, it's I based see. Based on signal strength, but mm -hmm. of course, if you have a really high-powered transmitter and a, um, a an excellent antenna and excellent receive sensitivity, you can essentially fool the distance by having too much power or having more power. Mm -hmm. But so, it's so but in the bunk. in the home scenario, like you're saying, basically, my neighbor maybe two houses away in every, every direction, mm -hmm. would have to have a Philips Hue bulb to reach that 300 right. feet, right? I mean, it right. depends on how close your houses property. are in the, yep. in the air. Certainly in an urban city, you'd be able to, to propagate pretty well. Um, Absolutely. And, and, As opposed my Philips to a have, rural I mean, it, city. Yeah, mm -hmm. but in my house, my Philips Hue bulbs have pretty good reach. I mean, I centrally locate my Philips Hue bridge, <clears> and my bulbs can be either in the, the basement or on the second floor, and I never have an issue. So that yep. tells me that the, the signal is probably bleeding outside of my house Absolutely. in order to do that.
So, so yeah, let me ask a really stupid question. What exactly are these bulbs doing for you from a, from a, uh, an IOT perspective? Oh my God. They're, how do you not live without Philips Hue bulbs? They can change uh, color. I've, I've been dimmable. doing it for years. So tell me what I'm missing. They're dimmable. They can change color. You can get light strips. You can get the blooms. Uh, and essentially, you, so you can buy these little uh, like uh, on-off switches that you mount on the wall. So they become your, your light switches. Uh, and then you can program it so that they change color or certain bulbs just allow you to uh, program the dimmable uh, feature of it and they can automatically turn off and turn on. <coughs> then you can have your Amazon Echo tied to that as well. I, In I other words, I can say, I can say Alexa, yeah, Alexa, Alexa, Alexa watch down yeah. low and play some Barry White. Yeah, or Alexa sexy time and that automatically turns the lights down low. It makes one of them glow red and it puts on Barry White. Uh, oh, crap, it, my Alexa's playing Barry White right now. <laughs> yeah, a, a lot of them, uh, they'll tie to a, a home entertainment center, right? Because there is actually a, a, a great benefit. I actually just last weekend put one of the light strips behind my TV. Um, so when I get the Amazon Echo, I can kind of say, you know, Alexa, watch TV. And it'll automatically dim all the other bulbs in the room. It'll turn on the light strip behind the TV to glow a certain color and then turn the TV on and allow you to watch TV. And that light behind the TV actually makes the screen kind of pop out more. It makes it easier to view. Uh, so I, the, and Ed Scotus has a great implementation of Philips Hue uh, in his office as well. He walks in and he says, good morning. He has it connected via uh, Siri. He says, good morning. <clears throat> you know, the, the blinds go up and lights go off and, and all that kind of stuff. So it is really cool. I think, it's a, I think it's a great feature. Uh, the Philips Hue bulb, bulbs are are pretty awesome. Uh, I like some them. some of us still have a flint and steel and we'll just have to light our lanterns every morning. <laughs> That's and, right. You know. <laughs> That's so, right. Whale oil, so whale, whale blubber oil. There you go. Whale oil. That's that's what we're using. A fine Rhode Island product. So. At, at what point does the discussion come like, wow, that sounds amazing, Paul. I, I don't know how I live without it, but I am living without it. Um, you know, when does the discussion shift to at what price or at what point do we do we say is is, is the, the risk that's introduced by all this cool technology that does all these cool things? Uh, when when does it when does it become not worth it because of the risk? Well, can, can I can I answer? Go ahead. Absolutely. My answer is fiduciary harm. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think the best analogy. You're going to have to explain what fiduciary is to Paul. <laughs> okay. Because well, he doesn't even know how many Supreme Court justices were supposed. Oh, to Oh come have. on now! No, I said no <laughs> trivia. <laughs> No trivia. This well, isn't the Jay Leno. Trivia, the Supreme civics. Court justices have nothing to do with fiduciary <laughs> harm. I, Two different I, things. I think, I think that technology That'd be judiciary still, harm. Well, technology is still in the, in the Wild West model of existence, Absolutely. which means that, that until, until harm is done to a large enough entity that it costs you know, significant money, and, and, and that's obviously a real snaky, weaselly term, where, you know, the federal government may say, well, $100 million rounds to zero, but, you know, I say 10000 or you say 1000 or whatever. And technology is still in that Wild West honeymoon mode of, of we don't really know. The government hasn't really figured it out. I doubt there's very many people in D.C. who even know what a Phillips Hue is. They probably think it's a part on a, on a ship that, you know, that that's being implemented. So... I, we're not quite there yet where that level of fiduciary harm has risen onto the, the radar of the government, but we're getting there. And the Internet of Things can be the thing that, that triggers that because it is so massive. And if we get to that point, then all of a sudden you're going to see this bad period of, of overregulation and stupid regulation and things like that until somebody learns how to deal with that. So there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I think back and forth on it still going on right now where this town says, check your firearms at the sheriff's office. And this town says, hey, you know, you're responsible for your own safety. Draw down on anybody that make, you know, whatever. And, and that's that Wild West model of whatever you want to talk about. And I think we're still there right now where, you know, my neighbors got hue bulbs and they're causing all kinds of chaos, but there's not much we can do about it. I've got a lantern. Uh, you, you know, you've got an old incandescent bulb that you made yourself with glass blowing skills or whatever, and, and we're just not quite there yet. But it's get, it's well, getting there. I, I think it's the evolution of technology, and 
what's scary is the technology we're talking about is a connected technology, and I don't think there's an example of that in history where everything is now connected. There have been advances in technology that have improved the convenience and safety of our homes that we all now get by default. So we have smoke detectors in the house. You may have a home alarm system. You may have light switches that you can turn on and off. We, at some point, we didn't have that, even that technology in the home. The next evolution of technology in the home are these connected devices. And right now, it's like Doug said, it's the Wild West. We're progressing to the point, whether we like it or not, where this technology is going to be standard in every home. And we're not going to progress there as a society until, I think, really bad things happen and then we learn how to implement these things securely. And before, our light switches and our uh, smoke alarms and our thermostats, none of that was connected before. It was great technology, but it wasn't connected to anything. So there wasn't that safety aspect. There wasn't that security aspect of it. Now there is. And I think there's going to be this cultural shift that needs to take place yeah. before these things just become standard. When you buy a home, some point in the future, the convenience factor of having this technology is just going to be there. It's going to be when I walk in, it senses my smartphone and depending on the time of day, adjusts all of my lights automatically. I don't have to go search for a light switch anymore. Those small conveniences are going to happen. When someone walks in front of my house at night, the lights are automatically going to come on. There's going to be convenience and security and safety uh, factors that are going to come into play with this technology, but only at the time in which we can provide a secure level uh, for all of these devices. And, and that vector is the citizens going to the sheriff and saying, I'm tired of this. I want something done because every night I come home and I, my lights are supposed to go on and dim and all these tricks. Right. And they're not. They're all flashing violently and you know, all my colors are all messed up because the 12 year old kid next door is hacking my house. And that's when the legislators are going to get involved from that angle without fiduciary harm, because they're going to say the citizens have made enough noise that we got to do something about it. And then you, then you may, again, get stupid regulation that takes time to sort itself out. Absolutely. Wow, we spent a lot of time on IoT. Jeff, you have more comments? Well, we... Yeah, you know, we obviously are spending most of the session on this, but it's uh, true. It was the most interesting stories to me this week. It was the most interesting story, other than talking about politics. Um, no, Mm-mm. we're not going to talk about that. I have another no, we're story not on about IoT. Uh, it, D, the DMCA has been used uh, to stifle legitimate research. However, um, it has been uh, there is an exemption to the DMCA uh, in effect that allows you to basically research things like your car. I don't know if anyone else saw this story. I don't have much more of the details other than that. Uh, The EFF did post an article um, on October 28th titled, Why Do We Have to Wait a Year to Fix Our Cars? There's been some stalling in in this process, but from what I understand, we are able to do some research now in spite of the DMCA. which I think is important to our current conversation about being able to implement this technology securely. If we're not able to look into the security of it because of regulation, (laughs) then how is it ever going to get better? Yeah, but not. I don't think it ever gets better and maybe I'm short sighted, but uh, you know, the, the, you know, this whole industry is all of, you know, arguably 25 years old and most of it has been built on a a perception of data loss from a from a company corporate level. The the when you transcend into the consumer space, uh, I I think the 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 ground rules are completely different, and we're just not really equipped to go there yet, other than regulation. But but what's the motivation for the regulation? Yeah, I agree, it's a fiduciary thing, and it hasn't happened yet, but. You know, we all sit around and talk about all the insecurity of things and, and, and how nothing is ever going to be secure. So that's going to transcend into this Internet thing world in the consumer world. I, I don't know what comes out at the other end. Yeah. Now, now note this uh, this uh, exemption currently under DMCA is only valid for two years. Mm-hmm. 
and is uh, the the uh, the intent is and the hope is from our side anyways is that we can prove enough wrong with some of this stuff to make it a permanent exemption. I think that's in today's environment certainly possible. <laughs> yeah, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, that's an easy win for us. Yep. Uh, a small a small win. I mean, it's easy to prove that these devices are vulnerable. It's another thing to progress to the point where. I can have a smart home with everything connected from the thermostat to the light bulbs to the television to the refrigerator uh, to the other appliances in the home and have some level of security that's higher than it is today, which the bar is really low right now, but there has to be some minimum standard of, of security. Kind of like, we, is we, it we like PCI, Jeff? Is there weeks some minimum ago, standard? Paul. Go ahead, Jeff. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago when I the last time I was in studio. What's the motivation for being secure in terms of a, a, a home, a consumer landscape? Well, that's the um, thing, and, and it's interesting how it's played out, is that the repercussions are felt by other people, not the manufacturers or the consumers. Right. So, yeah, I might have a minor inconvenience. It might not work for a, a short period of time or... I'm able to like unscrew my light bulb and screw it back in, and it works just fine. So it's a minor inconvenience on the consumer, but it's a major inconvenience for other people that are connected to the internet. And, and that, in some respects, makes it makes it unique. I don't know if there's a a parallel we can draw from, you know, like everyone has to have a smoke detector in the house so that if your house catches fire, it doesn't catch your neighbor's house on fire. However, the person's house who caught fire first is probably in worse shape. So you're motivated to get that inspection and make sure that you have all your smoke detectors in place because you, you're having the most severe consequences. In this case, it's the opposite. I may have little to no consequences in my own home. However, other people on the internet may be in a world of butt hurt and whatever on them. And, and, and that's, I think, the case that Bruce is making that regulation is the way to deal with that. Because there's, there's no sense of responsibility for me because I'm not in, in, uh, suffering any consequences from it. I agree intuitively that regulation is the only solution. What I'm not convinced of is who or what do you regulate? You know, who pays the fines? Who, or something? Yeah, who pays for it? Is it a combination of the, the manufacturer and the consumer? Um, and, and how do we maintain a free open market? In, in this, scenario. yeah, and that transcends the 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 um, point that Schneier was making about whether it's you know stupid or smart government intervention regulation. Uh, I mean, I guess it, it plays into the, you know part of whether it's smart or not is if you're applying the right pressure to the right it, you know entity within this whole with within this whole I mean, ecosystem. Maybe we're all saved by. Building security into the actual hardware in the chip fabric, as was reported by Digital Trends, that says there are researchers, they got a grant, that are modifying CPUs to detect security threats. And my issue with this is, yes, you can build security into the, the, the hardware fabric, and I want to get feedback from all of you on this, but... Software inevitably has to interact with the hardware at some point. So, like, what's the, the lowest common denominator in terms of security? Is it the hardware? Is it the software? Or if the software is always vulnerable, does it matter how much security features are available in the hardware? I was struggling with this article. Uh, you've got seven, seven layers to worry about. Yep. Well, what if you just built the security into through the regulation to the ISP? So instead of worrying so much about trying to pass a building code that says you can't have this, you force the ISPs, which are large-scale entities and are already a monopoly, to put monitoring and control in place so that they could identify these sources and, and stamp them out before they really got rolling. And then that does a stifle creativity and development on the small end for somebody to build a new device. But the ISP is going to say, well, you put this light bulb in your house, we're going to cut you off. 
So you better make sure this stuff works. And then the ISPs can drive some of that and filter some of this stuff out at that level. The, the, and problem, the problem I have with that, Doug, is there's an economic factor that someone has to pay for that. And the ISPs, in my estimation, are not going to absorb that cost. They're going to pass it down to the consumers, yeah. which really just means it's more expensive for me to have internet. And I don't know about the rest of you and all of our listeners. Yeah, I but that's like going to be the my... same case if it's regulation. I mean, yeah. ultimately, the consumer is paying for it. Someone yeah. has to pay for Period. it, right? And Most ultimately, often... it's the consumer. There's right. no company in the land that absorbs the cost mm -hmm. out of out of any kind of you know uh, altruistic motives. They always find a way to uh, to share the love with the consumer. So right. Well, yeah, you, you can, you can pay, you can pay for it that way. You can pay for it in your internet connection. You can pay for it on the product end, or you can pay for it in taxes. It, it, you're yes. going to pay for it. Right. So, right. I mean, that, that's going to happen. I mean, it's like seat belts. You're, you're going to pay for, you know, that, that safety initiative. I mean, if there's any truth in all of this, it's that the consumer will pay for it, Paul. Yep. Ultimately. I, I, I don't disagree. Um, well, that's that's good. That's the I wisest tried to thing get, you've I tried said to, all evening. <laughs> I tried to get us off of this topic, and you brought us right back. So now I'm going to just go to a completely different topic and talk about Facebook you, buying back. You can try. Go ahead. I'm going to try. Facebook is going to buy back black market passwords. That's what they said. They actually, to protect users, will go in the black market and pay for password lists and then notify their users. And in this case... To relate it back to our previous conversation, which inevitably we're going to get drawn back into, <laughs> is that they have Facebook has not passed the cost down to Facebook users. Facebook hasn't said we're going to go buy these password lists to protect our users. And you know what? Every Facebook user is going to have to pay us a dollar, which would be at this point what seven hundred million dollars or whatever it is. However, how anyone? How many Facebook users? Greg, you've been quiet over there. I apologize. We haven't involved you in this conversation. <laughs> You haven't weighed in on government regulation in the political climate today. <laughs> no so I'm going to throw you a softball and let you use Google and figure out how many Facebook users <laughs> are let's, there let's now. Let's take a look here. It was like, it's got to be 700, my, I don't know, my guess is 700, 800 million. Let's see here. 160 or 1.66 billion. 1.66 billion. The last time we talked about that statistic, they were crossing the 500 million mark, and that was a few years ago. So, so that's divide the cost by the number of customers, and that's how much they're going to change the rate. You won't see it as a consumer, but I'll guarantee you, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna defray well, it, the cost. It's interesting because Facebook doesn't consumer. pass the their revenue stream doesn't come from users; it comes from advertisements. So. When I take out Facebook ads, I've probably gone up a couple of dollars in my Facebook ads to cover Facebook paying the black market to retrieve the blacklist so that they can notify their users. That's kind of interesting. This, this uh, one is I, interesting. That's, that's one of the things like it kind of parallels what companies like Owl Cyber are doing right now with uh, scraping the black market and, and looking through the dark net uh, data mm -hmm. dumps and stuff like that for data that affects their customers. So it's kind of an interesting story. In, in well, that I, I, I saw that story, and I, I wasn't. I, I put that in the category of, of negotiating with terrorists. Yep. And the reason people don't negotiate with terrorists is it just encourages more terrorists. Mm -hmm. And so if right. Facebook says, we're going to go out and buy this password list from this hacker group in the Ukraine, so they pay them, they give them the list, two days later another list is going to pop up, and somebody says, well, we've got one too. And it's just kind of a never-ending cycle that's not going to accomplish anything. They need to work harder on securing this stuff and less on let's you let's buy these lists up from the black market. That's like saying we're going to go out and buy all the weed up to get rid of weed. That's not going to get rid of weed. <laughs> it's just going to make more people grow it so they can sell it back to the people that are buying it up. It, Sorry, it I'm like no right. I'm like, why is my you're, crotch you're increasing getting increasing market demand? I'm like, why is my crotch, yeah. <laughs> why is my crotch getting warm? I I dropped ash right. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I need to stand up for a second. Sorry, I'm continue. To comment on that. Continue one of talking. The, <laughs> one of the interesting things with this, too, is like, how are they going to validate that these are even legitimate passwords? Are they going to go test all of these yep. before they before they make any changes? Or or how is that actually going to affect their, their user base? 
Sorry. I, I, I thought this was a very silly uh, thing for them to say because it just encourages this. And, and you know, and, and it makes it, it makes Paul's crotch get warm. It apparently. does. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> apparently it does. Like on fire. It makes my crotch on fire. We saw that in a lot of Good games. Lord. Now that has to be the title for this episode is crotches, <laughs> on, crotch fire. on fire. <laughs> Crotches good on fire. Lord. <laughs> what's, what's it's a good thing that we're not uh, regulated by the FCC. This Otherwise, that would be an issue. Fire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. We can get a. Yeah. This crotch is on fire. Now you got a new theme song. <laughs> we'll, we'll get a t shirt too out of this, no doubt. That's it. I want it. A slogan, a dance, a URL, a domain, the, the whole thing. The whole thing. Got it all. Got it all. <laughs> wow. Larry, did you see the article on uh, the uh, HID hacking toolkit? Uh, no. Which article of this was are yours? So uh, this is my story number one. Um, it's basically a, a Teensy device uh, that they've built in a whole bunch of tools to, uh, which I don't think is anything new. I, I kind of, like, I was reading the title of the article. And I'm like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. And then I read it, I'm like, that's really nothing new. Uh, I was kind of hoping it was a toolkit for, like, compromising HID devices that are, like, used for other purposes and using them to attack things. But this is like a, a USB key that you basically create that you plug in and it acts like a HID device uh, and does malicious things. It supports Windows, Linux, and OS X and allows you to do all kinds of uh, nefarious things. Uh, so it looks like a pretty complete... Uh, toolkit, so it was different one than I thought, but still uh, kind of cool. Yeah, no, I hadn't, I hadn't seen this one, and and of course, you know, I'm coming out of hid devices, and you're talking about that, and I wasn't thinking about human input devices. I was thinking like um, uh, all of the RFID or contactless cards or NFC type stuff. Yes, because um, Hackfest last week, Deviant and his crew were there doing their six day long pen test, physical pen test course. Mm. And in which the six-day class, they uh, start doing electronic um, yes. penetration, in which they used the BLE key, and they have a new device that his uh, he said is going to blow the BLE key away called the ESP key. And I didn't really get a chance to talk to him about it or see the device or understand what it works, but he says the BLE key is like child's play now compared to the ESP key. Interesting. I was talking to Deviant on, on Twitter and trying to get him to come on the show, and it sounds like he has something really interesting to release, so we'll harass him to come on the yes, show. Yes, yeah. Tell, tell him he needs to come on and talk about the ESP key. Okay. Because I said so. Hey, hey Paul. <laughs> yes. Is, is that a Samsung Galaxy Note in your crotch, or are you just happy to see me? No, I use a Google Nest, Nexus 6P. Uh, it was an ash from my cigar that made my crotch warm. Well, then all of you, too, which... Just, you well, know. just as a side note, I just bought this crotchesonfire.com, so... <laughs> <laughs> I, I told you, to, when things happen on the show, domains are registered, <laughs> episodes get named, Twitter accounts are created. It's That's just... how I ended up with boardbondage.com. Come on. <laughs> how I ended up with spearfishingforpoopsharks.com. <laughs> <laughs> Larry and Doug are like in a race in for like most domain names registered while recording the show. That's awesome. Yep. That's also how I ended up with enterjohnsmom.com. <laughs> 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 Did I also mention Larry's uh, other truck and Larry's other other truck? Dot yeah. com. <laughs> yeah. Dot com. Uh, yep. Microsoft uh, is furthering their commitment to security updates. It made a bunch of changes to its program and have created the security updates guide so that now you can sort and filter security vulnerability and update content, filter out products, and leverage a new RESTful API to obtain Microsoft security update information. Kind of staggering that when you reach a point where you're releasing so many vulnerabilities that you make a RESTful API available for your products <laughs> to take advantage of <laughs> for all of your security <laughs> updates. Uh, sounds so and so I mean, uh, in, 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 in all fairness to Microsoft, that's not a knock on their products. It's a very significant product in the mar market, obviously. Uh, so I think that's actually really cool how they're, they're making all of that available. 
Uh, at no cost to the consumer. At no cost to the consumer. Maybe they'll be regulated, Jeff. <laughs> that's um, that's another that's another legal where you know again they can say we made this available to you. You can't sue us for these vulnerabilities. It was up to you to take care of it. We gave you this great tool that you could have used, but you didn't. That that goes to the definition of fiduciary, Paul. It, there you go. I thought it was judiciary. Is that? No, oh, it's different. Fiduci- fiduciary. 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 Is that and like of all fi- people, I would have thought Paul would have known fiduciary because it involves money. Financial responsibility is your fiduciary responsibility. Mm-hmm. Hey, somebody knows how to use Google. I didn't use Google for that. <laughs> yeah, that was, he, he didn't use Google for that. He has a pecuniary interest in it. <laughs> I have a fiduciary <laughs> interest in the judiciary system, Jeff. I want to talk about Netflix uh, really quick here. Uh, so they fixed a bug that allowed uh, content pwnage via voicemail. So like if you have T-Mobile, for example. So basically you start the Netflix password reset screen, place a call to the victim so that auto call redirects to voicemail. I'm not sure what that, I'm, I'm still trying to struggle to understand how the tech works. And then spoof the victim's caller ID to get voicemail um, box access. That makes sense to me. And play back the security code. So apparently Netflix oh. had a system with read you like verbally. It's not a, a text message. They verbally read you the security code. And you place a call to the victim so that auto call redirects to the voicemail. I don't know what that right. means. What does that mean, Larry? So, so if you think about this, so what do, what do you do? Uh, you want to, I want to, Paul, I want to reset your uh, Netflix password. So I go to Netflix. I know your account. I hit the the reset password thing. It uh, calls you or you set it to right. call you. It calls you with the new password. Yes. But because you don't recognize the number, you hit the power button, it goes to voicemail. Mm-hmm. I spoof my phone number as yours. And when I call Verizon, right. say Verizon's uh, T-Mobile, voicemail. T-Mobile. It it thinks it it T Mobile whichever it thinks that I am you and allows me into your uh, voicemail box unauthenticated. But it sounds like I start the password reset to Netflix, and right after I do that, I call you, so you don't recognize the number or so that or it, call it so it's already busy and it goes to voicemail. Yeah, it calls so it you, so that it's yeah. it's ringing right, and then Netflix calls, and the Netflix call goes to voicemail, then I spoof yep. my caller ID. I think it's yeah. how they're describing the attack to gain access to your voicemail. I got yep. you. I got yep. you. See, me, see, if it were me, if it was an unsolicited call, like I hadn't triggered it to Netflix. I wouldn't have known who the number was, so I would have just sent it to voicemail. Right. Would have declined it, sent it to voicemail, and if it's important, they'll leave a message and I'll call them back. And, well, sure enough, it was important. It was my damn password. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, essentially, that security code for that period in time uh, is your password. So right. yeah. having it, it actually read SMS in this case is actually more secure because implementing this attack in SMS is, is a lot, it, it, a lot trickier. I mean, if not close to impossible, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not the world's most foremost, uh, like phone hacker like that. Right. But, uh, I would need to be in proximity to intercept something into someone's SMS to receive that call. Where in this case, you can be completely remote, I think is the big difference. So ne- Netflix has fixed this uh, bug. Good. Which I don't know if you'd want to go through that much work to gain access to someone's Netflix account. I mean, how much does Netflix cost them? Yeah, it's like three ninety nine or 4 What's the base level Netflix? Is it three ninety nine? I think it's seven ninety nine now. What is it, Greg? Do a Google search now. <laughs> <laughs> Our Denver, Colorado oh, correspondent on up, the co- there we go price correspondent the price correspondent seven <laughs> seven seven ninety nine seven ninety nine is the bit and it's then like, you can pay more to have more computers access uh, streaming Netflix at one time that's that's three that's three computers for seven ninety nine you pay fifteen a month if you want to get the dVDs uh, shipped yeah. to you as well and uh, then yeah if you have more than three computers you have to i think it goes to like fifteen for streaming gotcha or you can get cody for never mind uh, yeah exactly. that's a that's a different <laughs> show that's the after show uh did you guys have anything else <clears throat> 
Negative Batman. Oh. All righty. Well, I want to thank our special guest, Greg Foss, for being with us this evening and all our special hosts, Mr. Jeff Mann, Larry Pesce, and Doug White. Thanks, everyone, for watching Paul Security Weekly. Larry, take us out. Over and... Ah, is that a hot ash on my crotch? Out. <laughs> this crotch is on fire.com. Don't forget. <laughs> See you guys.